Welcome to the Patton College of Education's new Munch and Learn series, Global Issues on Immigration. Through these discussions, we seek to increase our understanding of others in order to advocate for and build more inclusive communities. The intersection of immigration and higher education is longstanding. It is important to understand how current immigration challenges and policies are impacting our students and campuses and communities and determine how best to support them. Why should we prioritize support for undocumented students and international students? According to the Center for Higher Education Leadership, First-generation immigrant students, including undocumented students, second-generation immigrant students, and international students make up close to a third of all students in post-secondary education nationally. Bringing it closer to home, Ohio University's Athens campus and the Patton College have international students enrolled at over 4%. Many first and second generation immigrant and international students look to see whether campuses and institutions are undocu-friendly. In other words, are we welcoming, inclusive, and supportive? How institutions and colleges of education respond to immigrants, international students, and their families matters. Much can be done to be an inclusive university and to demonstrate our support for these students. But as with any students, we need to avoid one-size-fits-all approaches to advising and student support. Instead, we must develop culturally responsive and integrative student-centered care. According to Nakata, a global association for academic advisors in higher education, a culturally responsive student support an advising approach considers social and psychological conditions that affect this particular student demographic. Undocumented immigrant families face constant economic, social, and legal challenges. They increasingly experience the psychological impacts of being a cultural but not a legal citizen and may feel like they are living in limbo not fully belonging anywhere. Only a small percentage of undocumented students actually pursue and successfully complete U.S. post-secondary education. And those who do make it to college have overcome great odds and have built above average resiliency. According to Nakata, best practices for building an inclusive culture involve creating a network of support creating safe spaces to enhance peer and ally support, ensuring confidentiality and campus safety, and providing outreach and resources, including critical legal support and promoting civic engagement. As we begin our discussions on global issues on immigration, know that this series aspires to address these best practices to encourage meaningful dialogue. While we are talking about best practices for higher education, we must particularly employ these practices in colleges of education. We are preparing the next generation of teachers and human service professionals who will also need to provide culturally relevant support and services to immigrant children and families. Recent demographics from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and the Pew Research Center shows that in 2012, there were 11.4 million unauthorized immigrants in the United States, or 3.5% of the nation's population, from which approximately 2.1 million were K through 12 aged students. Our nation's past practices and how we treated children and families who are seeking to come to the United States for a better life have not been representative of who we have historically been as Americans. We have a responsibility to turn the page on that sad history. On the day of his inauguration, President Biden did just that. He signed an executive order to preserve 
the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, otherwise known as DACA, which has shielded hundreds of thousands of people who came to our country as young children from deportation. In the words of Miriam Feldblum, co-founder and executive director of the President's Alliance on Higher Education and Immigration, if we're to think broadly about the impacts of immigration across our campuses and act collaboratively, locally, and nationally to support students and other campus stakeholders, we will be in a position to affect positive change in the short and long term. It's the right thing to do. It's the wise thing to do. And it is at the core of our educational missions and communities. Thank you for joining this session on Global Issues on Immigration. My name is Greg Kessler. I'm a professor in the Patton College, and I'll be your moderator for today's discussion on immigrant experiences, families, careers, and communities. This is the first of our four-part Munch and Learn series about global issues on immigration, sponsored by Ohio University and the Patton College of Education. Today's event is being recorded, and a recording of the session will be live on the Patton College YouTube channel. Also, let me provide you a few instructions for participation. We invite you to place any questions you may have for the panelists in the chat, and we will get to as many of those as we have time for. That said, due to the time limited here we have together today, we may not get to all of your questions. At the end of the session, we invite you to fill out an evaluation that will also be placed in the chat. So we encourage you to take a few minutes and share what the event means to you and how you experienced it. So I wanna begin with some introductions of our panelists. Our panelists for today's event include Dr. Ashley Allenson, He's an assistant professor of instruction and coaching education in the Department of Recreation and Sports Pedagogy. I'm going to ask Ash to introduce himself very briefly. Thanks for that, Greg. And I'm really appreciative to be here today to share my experiences. Uh, as Greg mentioned, um, I'm an assistant professor of instruction in the Patton College and more specifically coaching education. Uh, I'm originally from England, uh, a big city called Kingston upon Hull, which is in the northeast England. Um, it's kind of an industrial town and a bit of a working class town. Uh, I actually graduated from my hometown university, the University of Hull, with a PhD in Sport Exercise Sciences in 2014. And I actually arrived at Ohio University in the fall of 2017. Uh, and thank you for inviting me today. I look forward to sharing my experiences with you and the rest of the panel. Great. Thanks, Ash. Next, we have um, Gabby Castaneda Gleason. She's an assistant professor of instruction in the Department of Linguistics. Hi, I am Gabby uh, Castañeda. I'm a faculty member from the Linguistics Department, and I am originally from a small city of over a million people called Aguascalientes. It is in the central part of Mexico, and it's a very monolingual and monocultural uh, city compared to other cities in Mexico and also in within the states. So I came to Ohio University as a student in 2002. Then I went back to home for two and a half years and I came back to Athens again to do some research and I just stayed. So I am currently the director of the English World Program that offers English as a second language um, classes to the to the Athens community and our students are spouses of professors and students but we also have uh, have had students from a more hidden international community that also lives lives in Athens Ohio we have had students from that work in local restaurants which were pretty affected because of the pandemic but thank you for inviting me thanks Gabby next we have Papa Ousu Kwarteng he's a service owner of learning spaces in the office of information technology all right, thank you, Greg. Uh, my name is Papo Sukwait, and as Greg said, um, I am here. Uh, I'm, I've been in many roles at Ohio University for uh, over my life here. I came to Athens first as an undergraduate student. I have uh, now I have a master's working on a PhD as part of my student role. Um, in my professional role, as Greg said, I work in the Office of Information Technology right now as a service owner. Um, for learning spaces and my current role kind of ties my academic and professional role really well by 
working across the high universities um, learning spaces to kind of marry technology and practice and other um, stuff we're doing. Um, I am originally from Isamankese via Accra, Ghana. Um, I have I have a very, I'm very passionate about my background of being an African ma male in higher ed in the United States and internationally. So I'm really excited to share a lot of my experiences with you and hopefully we, we can learn from each other on this panel. Thank you. Great, thanks Papa. And finally, we have Dr. Gabriela Papa. Um, she's an associate professor of physics in, from Ohio University, Zanesville. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gabriela Popa, and I teach physics and astronomy at Ohio University Zanesville. As you have heard, I am originally from Romania. And I am from a very small town, not like in Mexico. Very small means about 20,000 people. And I am a graduate of University of Bucharest, where I got my degree in physics. And after that, I came to United States to graduate school. I have been in United States for a while until I reached uh, Ohio University, but I'll tell you about that more. I am right now very happy to be part of this panel and thank to the organizer for that. Thank you, Gabriella. So I want to start by having our panelists um, tell us a little bit about their experience as immigrants in the community. And I'm going to start with Ash. Thanks, Anne, Greg. Um, I guess the biggest thing for me is I've had extremely positive experiences since arriving uh, in Athens, especially. Uh, but I think that because my uh, language is obviously English and, and Americans speak English, that has definitely assisted my experience in terms of answering questions, uh, asking questions and, and being able to have them connections with with the individuals at, uh, in my department, in the Patton College and obviously the university and in the community. And I think that the personnel that I've interacted with since being here have been absolutely amazing in helping me and um, guide me through the processes of becoming uh, into and an integral part of the of the school and, and obviously the, the department, but obviously the community as well. I just got to say a big thank you to, to Beth Kaufman from Legal Affairs. She's assisted me a lot through the, the H-1B visa, which is what I'm on currently. And a H-1B visa is basically you have uh, three years um, where you can come in as obviously for, for me, it's a faculty member. So it's kind of a job visa. And after kind of three years, it can get renewed automatically for another three years. Uh, and Beth Kaufman has, has assisted me through that process very well. And in fact, she's now gone through the process with the university and, and a big thanks to the university and the Patton College to go through the green card process, which is obviously um, to become a, a more of a, a sustainable legal immigrant here in the US. Uh, at the moment, it's in the final stages and hopefully it'll be approved in the next year. But despite all them positive experiences and, and that process of what I'm going through to potentially be um, a, a more um, legal immigrant here um, for a longer time. I think that there's there's definitely a, a lack of knowledge towards international faculty and staff from a domestic perspective. And that an example for me was that obviously with the university's furlough scheme that had occurred, because I'm on a H-1B visa right now, the furlough didn't actually apply to me. Um, and no one kind of knew that in my department. So when people were taking furlough days, I was kind of highlighting that I'm not actually on furlough and then I had a couple of questions based on that. So for instance, in the international faculty uh, and students will get asked questions that they may feel surprisingly uncomfortable answering sometimes. Luckily, I've got good personal relations, so that wasn't an issue. But not understanding everything that I'm allowed to do on my visa um, is, is an important aspect for the domestic faculty and, and people of the Patton College in my department. And one of the, one of the examples for that is that your H-1B, H-1B visa has got to be situated alongside very strictly your letter of employment. Um, so I've been asked to do kind of things at the university and outside in the community that I've been unfortunately not able to do. And that's no fault of those individuals. It's just a lack of awareness and then me having to explain that situation. But mainly these experiences have been very positive. I think I've been able to assist international students, uh, international students. And obviously that work has, has been something that me and Greg have actually done on the International Advisory Committee, um, which I think is, is something that we're trying to pursue, especially this year with this immigration um, perspective. But I also believe that students, especially domestic students, have definitely benefited from uh, the classroom experience in which I teach. 
I can give a more globalized perspective on coaching. And um, obviously, that is, that's my background, especially from the European standards, which are a bit of a gold standard in the world of coaching. So I feel like I've assisted students on understanding how to coach and those globalization aspects of, of sport and kind of move away from some of them traditional coaching methods that you see over here in the US in youth sport. And um, so I feel like through them connections with international students and domestic students, uh, I've been able to advise those students effectively. And also with international students, I've been able to advise them so that they can go through the processes that I might have gone through, even though they're on a different visa, it gives them a perspective and, and someone that they may be able to come and talk to um, kind of in a safe space. And I feel that's that's something that's benefited through my experiences and I'm able to learn from them students as well as the domestic students also. Well, thank you, Ash. That's that's really interesting. Next, um, I'd like to hear from Gabby. Um, I was very fortunate to come here um, as a Fulbright scholar, so that made things the transition from from Mexico to to America much easier. Like they helped me with all the the process. We, first, we were sent to a pre academic um, training in Buffalo, so we it helped us to. Um, to adapt to the system and then I came to Athens but everything became more challenging as long as like as soon as the, the Fulbright let us a little bit freer like uh, for example I had to to rent a car in Columbus Ohio which is the capital and then I had to come here and I was lost in in Columbus for two hours so if, if, of course that was 20 years ago so there weren't there weren't any GPS's and your phone or anything like that but um, and uh, uh, once I get into into Ohio University, uh, everyone was very welcoming. Uh, the only thing is that Athens is a college town, but there is also the outside, uh, like the, the outside part of Athens, which is not the the um, is not the university. So there are many different things like acronyms or cultural bound stories or jokes that international people don't get and just like it just blows by and and so you don't, you're not really getting the whole picture because of that uh for example with the the some of the, the experience that i had more recently was like going to the bmv and going like seven times because i had all my documentation ready but it was not enough so it, i had to go back several times so it's just the challenges that as international people we we face um but uh, like it, and in my case i'm pretty um fortunate to to be to be documented but i just can't imagine of people who do not have documentation that they cannot even go inside and have the the freedom to ask questions or they don't have enough uh, language skills to speak to the to the clerks so yeah it's uh, everyone has a different a different level of challenge thank you gabby um now i'd like to hear from papa Thanks, Greg. Um, I think um, both Ashley and Gabby really highlight uh, some of the challenges of being an immigrant um, within the United States um, system really well. Um, because both of them have spoken from um, the faculty perspective, and I'm going to speak a little bit more from the student perspective because you know I made the transition. I've made the transition from one level of student um, student from an undergrad to grad, and now to the professional world. And what they really, what both of them really said is really one of the biggest things. Like one of the one of the conversations or one of the common questions I have is, why don't you just become an American citizen? Why don't you just become legal? Um, and especially over the last couple of years, that conversation has become really prevalent in terms of, why don't you just become legal? Becoming legal or becoming a legal immigrant in the US, it's not just a matter of wanting to become legal. And there is a whole lot of bureaucracy tied to that. You know, you have to have valid employment. You have to be in status. Um, and being in status means being legal. And, you know, as an undergrad, I remember a couple of times when my I-20, which is the legal document to be able to be, um, be a legal student in the United States as an international student, was about to run out. And for me to renew that, I needed almost to show a bank um, statement of about thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars. Now, thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars sitting in a bank statement, unless you're a millionaire, I don't know where you're getting that kind of cash from, or you are into some other illicit behavior. And so, being able to show that kind of availability of funds all the time was very stressful. 
Um, it got to a point I, it got, I got so stressed about staying in status and being legal that I started losing hair. And I went to the I went to the health center and they're like, are you stressed? I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> of course I'm stressed. And here is why it's really stressful. Um, as both Gabby and Ash have said, it really limits, even when you're illegal, it really limits the opportunities and availabilities you have. So on the everyday life, everyday life, for example, once you're out of status or once you're not legal, you're not allowed to drive. Every, in, every time you go to the BMV, even as a legal immigrant, it is so difficult to upgrade your license, to change your license. And I speak English pretty well. And it got to a time over my time in Athens, I stopped renewing my license in Athens because it was always a challenge. And it was a challenge because I didn't know if it was because I was foreign, if I was black, or if I was anything. So I would go somewhere else to go renew my license just because it was just a challenge and it was a hassle to do that in Athens. Now, when it comes to the professional side of things, it really limits some of the things you can do. So thanks to Dean Middleton and the and Patton College, I one of the biggest highlights of my life was when I was um, the director for the Upward Bound program. And that program, we got to really engage with the community outside of the Athens community. And so, you know, we were serving nine counties, rural counties across 17 school districts in the, across Southeast Ohio. And we really made a difference. One of the difference I like to say was I was able to show um, parents and folks coming from those areas that competition in this world now, and it's not local, and it's not at the state level, it's not even at the national level, it's at the global level. And it's at the global level because regardless of what you say, if you don't meet the standard globally, somebody's going to take, somebody's going to meet it, and that person is going to be the person who is in the place. So being able to actively show that, and also being able to bring those families in and let them understand that Ohio University and the federal government as a whole was not leaving them behind, but we had programs to bridge the gap and do that was really great. Now, that was great personally from a professional level. From an other level, because I was not a legal or I was not an American citizen then, it really affected some of the grants we could apply for because if I was the one applying for the grant and I was not American, I couldn't apply for it. I had to find an American to partner with. As I've been part of grant programs where you have $2 million, $3 million grants, where the legal immigrant or somebody who's not an American has done all the work and then an American has gotten all the credit because we have to put their name on there. And so, so those are some of the challenges you face if you are not, say, an American citizen, and then some of the challenges you face if you're not a legal, so if you're just legal. And these things compound. So every time I hear people say, why don't illegal immigrants become legal? I kind of chuckle at that because it's like it's so so easy and it takes a long a long a long time to get that done. So um, just those are some of the challenges that, that have been very positive outcomes. Um, some challenging times, and you know we move with it and figure out different ways to uh, meet those challenges when they come. Great, thank Great, you. So I'd like to um, hear from Gabriella about some of your experiences as an immigrant to the community. So I came uh, to this country 20 some years ago before the internet where you couldn't search things. So I came as a graduate student and as a graduate student things were a little easy. The international office at the university, you know, they deal with international students, so they made it easy for us with like what paperwork do we need? Where do we need to go? Where do you need to go to the bank? You know, all of that. But yet, like um, the people before me uh, said, uh, there are some cultural differences. So first of all, my English was not like my English now. So I had that barrier. And when I talk to people at the university, they are used to being uh, to talk to us at the beginning slowly, you know, to write it down if we don't understand. But the moment you step a little bit out, even to the bookstore to buy a book or especially to the grocery store, nobody understands you. <laughs> so you have to be really like a monkey, you know, and try to, um, to do the best of it or try to look for things that you are using in our country and we don't know the name of it. <laughs> and like right now with Google, everything is easy, but then it wasn't so easy. And like other challenges we had is like when it comes to paperwork, even though like, um, you know, coming to a uni to a larger university, 
around or inside the university, it's relatively easy. The moment you step outside is not that easy. And you know, you have to maintain paperwork all the time. As a student, being on a student visa, you know, you always have some to have some paperwork that you have to update. Get the driver license license as a student. People there do not understand. Probably they don't have too many foreigners. And they always think there is something wrong. Even if you have, even if you show them the list. Look, it says here have this, 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 this. I don't know, maybe they are afraid not to make a mistake. So they usually say, oh, I have to call my supervisor, come again tomorrow, the supervisor is not here today. You know, everything takes longer and it's nobody's fault. It's just because, you know, people have to learn <laughs> that there are all of these things. And like people said before, you better have all the documents. And if the police stops you, the moment you have an accent, they immediately have their antenna up like something is wrong. It's nothing wrong. Coming as a student to graduate school to work on the PhD, there are in my department of physics more than 50% were students coming from other places. So it's not like we didn't feel a minority inside the department, but the moment you step a little bit outside, you, people don't know what to do with, uh, you know, with people with accents. But I think it's a learning opportunity for everybody. If there are challenges and I learn since I've been in this country for over 20 years now and right now and I'm an American citizen and it was frustrating when you couldn't do things that you want to do that you see your colleagues doing. Like you said, if you are an American citizen, you can do that. And it's not that you know you don't have the ability, you are in the same program and maybe it makes sense, right? Because people are paying taxes. Right now that I'm a taxpayer and I'm raising my kids here, I kind of understand why things are the way uh, they are. But it's always good to learn more and it helped me also learn about my culture and also coming to a different culture. It helped me learn about my own country from outside that I would never be able to learn and figure out some things that I have my understanding right now. So I really suggest to people to travel outside. Get some job for a year somewhere else in a different state. Even here in United States, I've been working in three states by now and there are differences. Some uh, challenges are because we are foreigner and we don't figure out everything right away. And some challenges are like local differences. The place matters. So uh, this is just like, you know, saying the things other people were saying. So the driver license is the biggest thing. Like in a small town in Ohio, I went, I think like seven times. I could not renew my driver license. I want to do the right thing. I came from a different state. I have a driver license. I have all my paperwork, but the people there just couldn't understand. So I had to go to Columbus where they see more foreigners and they they are not afraid that the law is right. If you do all the things on the list, it's OK. <laughs> Nothing wrong. You don't have to treat me like illegal because I did everything right <laughs> by the law. So I think it's a learning experience. And even now I'm here for 20 some years. Uh, how to say I have to remind myself when I see a new person, it's so easy to become comfortable. Even for me, who I was not born here, to look at other people and to forget how hard it is at the beginning, you know, to a new person coming in a new culture, in a new place where you don't know the little jokes and the little slang, maybe how you say certain things and to take it a little bit, you know, with humor. I had an office mate once that was uh, ready to retire and I was like just starting my job and he said, with a little humor, you can solve everything. Don't get upset because I was kind of frustrated. I didn't understand how things work. It was my very first teaching job and I want to do everything perfect. And the more I want it to be perfect, the more mistakes I made. <laughs> and it turned out not. So I don't know. I learned a lot being in this country as a foreigner being put in so many uncomfortable situations. And I think even though I've been put in a lot of uncomfortable situation and I survive, it's still easy to make mistakes. So I think we have to be understanding of each other. There are challenges at, at every step. Even now there are challenges. So 
some of them may not be because I'm foreigner, but I feel like, oh, because I'm not from here. I don't understand, right? So I think we shouldn't get upset. I think, I don't know, my learning from all of this is that we have to stay calm and don't get accept. I say that because just seeing what's going on nowadays. It's not because there are foreigners here. There will be foreigners. People are traveling, people are moving. And this country is a country of immigrants. So this is not going to change in one year, in six months. Um, that's what, what I want to share. And I hope, you know, I learn from everybody and I still learn from the other panelists and I hope everybody can learn from us a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. I, I, I really think that that's a very good advice to have people um, experience a new culture, to learn about your, your own culture and yourself. I, I think it's one of the best things that we can do um, for each other as well. Um, so we have a, a question I, I can, I've heard from a few of you um, about your experience at the BMV. And so there is a question from the audience. They want to know, is there something that you think the university could specifically do to help out with your um, experience at the BMV? And, and anybody can chime in on this. So I think the university is doing, they are sending papers, but I think putting a face, sometime making a call, or maybe have somebody from the university just visit once in a while saying, you know, we have these people, if you have this list, if they have everything in this list, it's OK, don't be afraid. <laughs> if they do everything, the list, you know, the law says or whatever, maybe just maybe the university people have to reach out a little bit to them that, you know, I don't know, even though I know in the place I went, people knew each other. They knew the lady, they knew each other. I don't know, maybe they have something in the past. <laughs> People are just people. Yeah. Um, so, Greg, okay. I would like to add on to that. I know that I know at some point um, in Athens specifically, um, ISF has reached out to the BMV to figure out something because this issue had, was an ongoing issue. But it's not just the BMV. Like, you know, if you go to the leasing offices and even internally at Ohio University, when you go to some offices, some offices are notorious for not necessarily being very helpful to international students. I'm not going to put anybody on blast there because we're in a professional setting. I can I can share that later. And sometimes, um, and um, I know the New York Times, there was just an article a couple of days ago about how even with President Biden's executive um, order that you immigration officers at the borders were not necessarily following that and doing that kind of stuff. And you find those across the system. So, for example, like everybody has said, when I have gone to even the Social Security office with an American passport and a naturalization certificate, I've been asked for more documentation. I'm like, what more documentation do you need? <laughs> you know, and so it's a matter of um, actively always um, engaging. Um, and so one of the things I normally encourage um, folks who run departments and units at Ohio University is if you have internationals in your space, don't leave it to, um, don't just concentrate on the work they're doing for you. Reach out to um, um, officers like ISFS to see how they are coaching and teaching folks in, in the work for you and then your main officers to help them out. Because for example, you go to an office and they ask you for your visa. A visa is just for entry. Nobody in the United States, once you're in the country, should be asking you for a visa. Why are you asking me for a visa? And fortunately for me, because I have been in touch with the system long enough, I know to ask these questions. And because I have more of a background, I know to ask these questions. But you don't always have international students able to answer these questions. So if I come to, say, a financial aid office and you're asking me for a visa, is that really necessary? I can ask that question. Not every international student can ask that question. And so actively always training our staff in terms of ask, knowing when to ask these questions and knowing when not to ask these questions and the tone they ask them is one of the main ways I think they invest because the BMV is an, it's an easy example, but it is by no means the only example or the only place where these things crop up in terms of feeling very unwelcome or very attacked in, in certain ways. I'm going to let other people chime in on that. Yeah, thank, thanks, Papa. That I, I definitely agree with that. And it's important to know your rights. So I, I think that's a very good place to start. Um, I think Ash has something he wants to share also. Yeah, I just want to add on to the 
kind of what Papa was talking about that way. It's not just the the DMV. It's it's other aspects. So it's like potentially credit cards, financing cards, mortgages, uh, as well as your driving license. But I just want to kind of highlight that being on a visa means that everything has a shelf life. That at some point, once your visa is going to run out, that means everything else, unfortunately, cannot be renewed after that process. So an example for me at the moment is um, that while I'm I'm on this kind of first three year visa, before it got renewed, one, there was a lot of anxiety about the renewal um, and the, the process that went there, especially with the, with the presidential, um, the previous pre presidential cabinet, there was um, obviously issues with, with internationals and international students and potentially international faculty. So there's a lot of anxiety whether that was going to get renewed or not, but the driving license had to end when that visa ends. And then the same with that with the car finance was like, if I'm having to go back home to England for whatever reason, then I don't want to be leaving any kind of debt here. I don't want to be leaving any kind of unpaid finances. So that was an important process for me and any anybody else that's an international in this country where you've got to you've got to always think ahead because there's that shelf life. And um, because once that visa runs out and if there's not a renewal process for whatever reason, then everything is then uh, raises that anxiety. And I think the big thing is once it does get renewed, you you have even more anxiety because there's a lot to do straight away that now you've got that visa process that you have to get everything renewed in time in case you do get stopped by the police and you're driving and you've got an out of date license um, or license tags or car finance payments. So, and even finding a new car. So I think we've got to be aware that our international students that, are, that we're teaching, could, they're feeling that anxiety when they're about to graduate. They don't know what their next steps are. So we've got to try and make them feel as comfortable as possible. And hopefully with those with this awareness that we're able to point them in the right direction. And I know that's a lot of things that me and Greg are doing, as well as the other committee members on the International Advisory Committee and the Patent College of Education. We're constantly trying to to find the right avenues for these people that might feel this way. And, and like Papa mentioned, it's kind of using the ISFF um, and making sure that we, we're there to assist individuals. But in my personal experiences, who's there to assist me as well, you know? So I'm going through that process doubly, if you like. So that, I just wanted to put that kind of shelf life and, and the anxiety that that can happen with that. Thanks, Ash. That, that's really interesting. You 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 all bring so much um, information to this. Uh, it, there are so many layers to all of this, right? Um, and it, it's quite complicated. Um, I, I In your introductions about your experience, a number of you have um, mentioned some challenges um, and I'd like to hear um, about some other challenges you may have experienced. I'm going to ask Gabby first. Yes, as a student, when I just first came to the United States, um, I had an American roommate who was taking the same uh, courses that I was taking. Uh, so on Friday nights, she would read her papers and be done like in half an hour. Well, it took me like three hours to complete my my assignment. So so definitely like uh, professors need to be aware that international people is going to is going to take them longer. All the readings and all the the um, the process because they have to decode from one language into the other and then go back to to the to English. So that's one of the the that was one of the challenges also. Uh, like the traveling, like we needed to save some money to be able to go uh, during the, the break to go home. Um, like, uh, for example, we had the, the winter break that was pretty, pretty long and winters in Athens for students are pretty sad. So if you just stay here, so it's important to have the, the economic power to be able to go back to your country uh, and and also like when I went to my country, my, my visas were were the TN. Afterwards, when I was doing the research work, my my visa was a TN visa, so they had to be renewed every every uh, year. So you do have to have the economic power to be able to go from your hometown, like from Athens to your hometown, from your hometown to the big city that has that uh, embassy where you can get the um, you can get the, the visa status change and all that. So. Uh, just be aware that the like the, so so those were the, some of the the things that uh, that uh, were a little bit challenging at that time. Also, Athens didn't have a bus system, so I would walk uh, to which was great. I walk from from my apartment to to the 
to my to school to Gordy Hall. But uh, uh, the, I was I was very impressed that several years later, um, the power of international people um, also like brought up the, a better um, transit system. So now there's more buses that that are that run all over the place because at the time there were there were like two buses and that was it. So you had to walk ev every every day. So you had to get a bicycle to go be able to go to Walmart and then uh, you had to put your all your bags in your bicycle and I'm from Mexico, right? So I'm not used to the winters in Southeast Ohio. So it was very it was very tough, <laughs> but um, but at the same time, we like it helped for the international community to get together. And when someone had a car, it's like, do you need a ride to go to Walmart? So we we like I had friends who would who would call us and we would all go together. So it makes us like, even though we are very isolated uh, because we, we we leave our families behind, we we get to have new family here that will care for each other and we'll, even just a small thing as a right to get groceries makes a huge impact on each person's life. Thank you, Gabby. Um, I'd like to hear from Ash. What what would you like to share about some other challenges that you faced? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge for me, Greg, uh, and the rest of the panel is that personally, I think I've had a lack of opportunity to give back to the community uh, in Athens, especially from my expertise, which is coaching and, and especially soccer. Um, and the biggest thing kind of because of my visa, I'm kind of restricted on what I can do, like I mentioned earlier, where you've got to literally be for, with the employers and whatever that letter of employment is, that's what you stick to. And it was interesting because uh, before I kind of knew about the the uh, the issues that would regard going out of these parameters, I was offered to be um, the, the high school assistant coach for Athens High School Girls the soccer team which I was very, very excited to do. I was thinking, one, I'm giving back to the local community. Um, and secondly, um, and, and obviously within a school setting. And secondly, I can use these experiences to enrich my students and um, using my personal coaching experiences, getting some video footage potentially, even um, utilizing some of the student athletes. And one of the things that, that came out from this was that I was not allowed to do that. Um, and recently I've had an offer to be the Alexander High School boys soccer coach as well. Um, coming up this upcoming fall and I've had to again reject that because my visa stipulations is that I've just got to work within this uh, Ohio University and the parameters of my employment letter and obviously there's, there are ways and means we can work through that because of service so one thing I do here is uh, advise and coach the the club soccer teams and um, which gets me back in kind of that that coaching field out the classroom which is something that I love to do but I really feel that, that that experience and that challenge of not being able to give back into the community uh, in something that I'm an expert in or so-called expert in is something that really frustrates me and, and it's something that I have to live with. And it's interesting if and when the, the green card process finally is accepted and approved and I, and I can be um, kind of here more on a more full-time basis, the first thing I want to do is go into them communities and, and give back and, and help the coaches and help the student athletes, as well as the, the soccer community and, and any sporting community in Athens and surrounding areas, because I'm here hopefully not only to, to help the students in terms of sport and coaching, but also help the community. And, and that's something I'd love to do to give back to, to those that love sport in the community. And that's part of, I feel my role as a professor here at OU to connect that kind of theoretical application in the classroom with that practical application out in the community. That's great. Thank you so much, Ash. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, so I want to move on to the next question. And I'd like to hear, since we've heard about some challenges, I, I'd like to hear a little bit about some support that you've received from the community. And so I'd like to start with Papa. Thanks, Greg. Um, I think um, the community support has always been great. And I am, you know, as a larger collective, I'm part of the, the Ohio University Collective, and I always like to go back to the professional and personal support I've gotten. Um, I think when I look back on my professional career at Ohio University, um, one of the things, and this is where I would like to bring my intersectionality as a fact that, you know, I'm a black man operating in a mainly, um, so I operate in a minority status here, which was something different and something I've had to learn, like Gabriella said, 
you learn more about yourself when you leave your country. And so I've had to reorient myself in the sense that in this space, I'm not necessarily the dominant culture or the dominant race, and I have to um, navigate systems a little differently. And so it's always, it's always, you're always grateful when you find um, folks who are willing to take a chance on you or give you the opportunity to highlight the skills you have. So like I, I look back on my time in Athens and look at some of the really great professional um, opportunities I've gotten. And I look at somebody like, you know, Lisa Flowers Clements, who gave me my first job in the Athens campus. Um, somebody like Dean Middleton, who not knowing me very well, gave me an opportunity to run a federal grant where we got the grant renewed and kind of gave that support. That was really helpful. Um, and then I look at somebody like um, Dr. Duane Robinson, who has always, has never been my direct boss, but has always been a mentor in the background who makes sure that um, it's kind of keep cracking the whip and making sure the right thing is done and being a sounding board. Those are professional opportunities and help that are not, um, you don't necessarily see that, but it shows you that representation matters because um, everybody has mentioned is a, a black female who has been leading in that way and they've given me a chance and so when I get a chance I'm able to give back in that way and as as somebody who is black in America that is really um, it's it's very touching for me and it's very motivational for me because it helps me link my story to the black story and it also helps me understand that I am not in this space even though I'm an immigrant I am one and the same with folks who are fighting some of these institutional battles and stuff. Now, um, on the other side, um, some of the um, some of the in addition to the mentoring and support, I think one of the things that uh, a lot of um, not just immigrants but um, certain folks who are international find really had to do is you know that um, because I don't have a good way to put it. Um, the very forthright way of saying, I did this, I did that, I did that. So in a way, that's self-promotion. That doesn't really come very easily to a lot of international folks. And so a lot of times, it's really difficult for us to get some of the um, ad hoc, um, not necessarily published opportunities to lead and stuff and to contribute. Then those are the things, those are the building blocks that normally help folks advance their careers. So, at the same time as we've gotten some of that professional stuff, I think that is one of the ways that I would encourage folks who lead departments, especially departments with international folks, to think about what are some of the skills and strengths of the people who are international or the people who are not necessarily white in this space and how are we leveraging that. Um, that helps That helps bring um, a, a lot of inclusivity to the spaces in which we are. It also helps us fully utilize the international and the um, minority um, skill, skill my, the skills of the minority folks in the spaces we have because um, we are not just diversity experts or we are not just um, these kind of experts. We have other skill sets that definitely help. And um, as much as it's a challenge sometimes, Athens is more welcoming than most, but there's still a long way to go um, to, to make it more welcome. I, I will end it then, let others chime in. Great, thank you, Papa. So um, I'd like to ask Gabby, what, what are some ways that you have received support from the uh, community? Um, it has been like, it's a, a very emotional part for me because I have, um, I have the personal support and also the academic one. Like when I came, when I just came here, here my advisor would invite several of us to go to his house so we would see like uh, the American family and and we would have the dinner that his wife would make and and it was very nice because it, we, we were not um, we have the feeling of family so it wasn't like oh you are my student and I just see you during office hours they would invite us to their home and I think that was a, a great experience now that I am studying the PhD so my my um, advisor invites me to have a cup of coffee and have those talks which is great I think that the human touch that makes that is extremely beneficial for international people now with the pandemic one of, of our professors puts food outside their porch so we anyone who, who doesn't have uh, dinner or lunch can go and grab a to-go meal so those humane um, behaviors are just so 
powerful and impactful to for every for for every person. And then for the academic part of uh, of uh, of it, the the fact that we as students or as faculty uh, have um, some money uh, assigned to go to conferences that I think that's a, a great opportunity to be able to meet experts of the area that we we uh, work on. So we get you have the chance to present, but also meet other people and, and that's phenomenal. So many of other uh, countries don't have that uh, that advantage. And I think that's that's a great opportunity uh, that the university offers. Unfortunately, not, there's been some some cuts and that's one of the the problems with the, the current economy. But now that things are online, it, they may be a little bit cheaper. So. Thank you, Gabby. Yeah, and I, I think that financial support for international students to attend things like that is is fabulous. And and in fact, I think here in the Patent College, they've um they've done that to an extent that I haven't seen elsewhere on this campus. So so I'm very appreciative of that. Um, especially because I have many international students who I advise, so they all benefit from that. Um, I, I'd like to hear next from Gabriella about some support that you've received from the community. So like the speaker before me said, during graduate school, I had an amazing support. Uh, and like uh, Gabby shared, um, uh, our PhD advisor also invited us at home, like once per year to have dinner with the family. And something that uh, you see in physics a little bit different, I did not have um, too many female professors. I had few in Romania and United States during my PhD, I had none. They are all men. And um, I came to this country married to my husband, who is also Romanian, and something amazing that seeing the professor in their house, that by the way, in Romania in my time, when I was a student, that would not happen. I have not even seen the office of my professor. I don't even know where they are. It's like so intimidating over there. I hope it changes <laughs> in the time. So here seeing that friendliness in the American society, and also going to our professor house, not only my PhD advisor, but also other professors when you're in the first semester and Thanksgiving came. Um, one uh, faculty who was also international faculty invited the whole class of statistical physics. I even remember now after 20 some years and our spouses or friends or significant other to his house. That was like unheard for for me. It was amazing and also seeing you know, the American faculty at their home, and I was very impressed that uh, the wife and the, the professor and the wife cook dinner together, so they serve us together, and together we clean the table, and the man and the woman that in my time, in my father did not do any of this <laughs> in, my, in Romania. So that was, very good also for us being you know young at the beginning and being married and for our husband especially for women i have to say that because probably my husband didn't even think about it. you're just you know newlyweds came to united states to graduate school we saw the the nice part of it but there are little bumps along the way just growing older and also being here so that was nice and also like gabby said our um, faculty, when I was a graduate student, make sure that we have support to go to conferences because we didn't have parents to support us. We have to save money to go home once in a while. You know, there is not these little things that uh, you have a little extra help it, that was nice that the university provided us. Well, later on, you, know, you become a little bit uh, older and going higher. It's kind of um, it's still hard, you know, not having the whole family, not having brother and sister and round. Um, but we are lucky. I think we as human find help. We find he people like us. So like we are very fortunate when we bought our house, my husband and I in a small town in Ohio, and maybe the realtor saw that we are worried or, or I don't know. He found the best house for us and the neighbor, the next like the next house neighbor happened to be a family who when they were young, the, uh, he served in military in Germany. So he really, I didn't realize at the time, but it was an amazing help. He checked on us after we bought the house every day for maybe a month, asking us, you know, do you need anything? Do, if, you, if you have any questions, ask me. If something breaks or 
stopped working. Ask me, we know, I know this house because, you know, the people were my neighbors and whatever. And that was amazing because not everybody understand. And I realized little by little that the other neighbors not that they weren't friendly, but I think they did not understand us and we didn't understand them. We had kids later because saying in graduate school, we married later, we have kids later. <laughs> and uh, when I went to the school with my kids, uh, you know, the other parents were at least 10 years younger, having the same age kids. So the community, how to say, it depends like how they see us, right? So those who can, they will always help, but you have to be comfortable, right? To help and to interfere in somebody uh, else's life. But the university system, I think it's amazing. And people in the community, I think it's starting to be more open now with the internet. Um, at Zanesville, many of my students do not move outside Zanesville. So I think it's amazing that I'm an international faculty there and I teach physics, they look at me like, they have to know like physics has this bad name kind of I don't know why maybe I don't know because there are hard things like for me it would be hard to do something else right so seeing that is possible you can do whatever like if it's easy for you why not it doesn't matter if you are a man or a woman so I think it's very important um, you know to learn from each other I keep saying that because I think people are learning from me and I'm learning from the environment around me. So that's what I want to share. That's great, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to hear from Ash also about some support that you've received from the community. Yeah, no problem. Similar to, to, to Gabriella and, and Gabby, it's, I, I feel like I was very lucky when I came here because of the university support system. That That's especially the Patton College and especially the, the Recreation Sport Pedagogy Department. It's such a, a, a collegial, um, integrated community where when I came, they kind of understood my situation. I came on my own in 2017. I got a one bedroom apartment and I didn't know anybody. So it's kind of like it was a big step for me to come and kind of basically reset my life and start a new life in a different country and um, came totally on my own. But the, the faculty members and the community members were, were, were fantastic. And the, I actually got invited to to be a part of a futsal community. And a futsal is a, is a small uh, five-a-side soccer aspect. And, and what's interesting about futsal is the two shirts behind me are actually, I represented my country at futsal. So it, that was one of my greatest achievements to represent your country. I obviously wanted to do it in soccer, but I probably weren't good enough and wasn't. So to, to get a kind of a second opportunity and do it and represent my country in, in futsal was pretty cool. And then when we start kind of conversing and, and having those, those, those conversations with faculty, um, uh, an ex-member of RSP, Danny Twilley, he, was, he mentioned about this futsal league, uh, which is done at the the uh, rec, Athens Rec Centre. So I got involved in that, and it was a great way to to kind of connect with individuals in the community. And there was people, there's such a diverse background because futsal uh, and soccer is such a worldwide sport. So this helped me actually get out in the community, and meet some great people, and from that I actually met uh, an individual called Ted Welser whose daughter was working, uh, he's, a, he's a professor at OU in the arts and sciences. His daughter was playing for the high school team. He connected me with the Athens high school coach. And then from there, that kind of coaching community was was able to start. Um, and and from that, that was building that kind of them, them bridges, if you like, for, to get back into the community. And they were all fantastic. And then I was very, very fortunate because in the summer of 2018, uh, I met my now partner and we've been together ever since. And she's she's from Athens, and her family's from Athens. So I've been in, able to integrate myself in the in the local community through the family, uh, and we are now engaged, and and we're, we'll be getting married, hopefully, fingers crossed, at New Year's Eve in uh, this year, if if the pandemic and all pan, pans out okay. But it's great. We've got a lovely house in the plains, so a lovely neighbourhood where there's other faculty members and coaches of the football team that live in that neighbourhood. So I feel such a good part of the community. But that came from me putting myself out there. And I think that's what any advice to anybody that is international, and I think Gabriella mentioned it, it's difficult to go outside your comfort zone. But I do think if you're on your own and all with a partner or with children, you've got to try and integrate yourself. It's not the community can just bring you in. It's a two way process. And I feel from that uh, I was lucky because in 2012, I came out and coached in America soccer again in 
uh, for three months and had a summer that was just incredible. I was in Philadelphia and my brother actually came out in the same year and he lived in New York City and he, he stayed there and married somebody. He's been here for a long time now um, and he now lives in New Jersey. So everything that I was dealing with was with these different communities in, in America. But Athens, Ohio is totally different to Philadelphia and New York City. And being involved in this kind of cultural, small rural college town, you've got to be really aware and mindful that the language is very different and, and the culture is very different. And you've got to you've got to understand and be aware that you've got to make sure that you take on board what people say. And I, I believe the faculty here in RSP have made a great impact on me because they have explained what the culture is in this place and they've explained those that live in Athens especially they've explained what's expected um, and I think that's been a real help and that's been my supportive network and it's grown and grown and grown and and I found a home here in, in three and a half years and I couldn't imagine not living here now and it's, it's amazing just because of the support I got from the community but the biggest issue for me personally is that I've got to continue saying soccer and not football. Uh, obviously, football is American football. This Super Bowl yesterday, which I absolutely love. So it's become ingrained in my kind of language and my terminology. And I think that's an important part of you integrating with the community as an international. You've got to really embrace the culture of where you are. And it, like I say, it's a two-way process. Thank you, Ash. That's yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and and hey, we all have our fingers crossed for you. So that's, um, yeah, good luck. I think by New Year's you should be fine. So uh, hopefully we'll all be celebrating with you at that time. And in case you didn't know, I'm, I'm ordained and I've done 21 weddings. So I, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm available. There's a lot of support here you might not be aware of. Thanks, um, great. <laughs> so I wanna follow up with a question from the audience. Um, and this relates to supports that are available. And so for those of you who were students at Ohio, um, did you utilize services like the Writing Center or the um, the Career and Leadership um, Development Center? So I'm going to go to Gabby first about this. Um, when I came here, there were still like it was a long time ago, so it's a little bit it was a little bit uh, um, uh, different. You, at the beginning, it was uh, the Ohio program of intensive English that were giving the academic classes for international people. But then there was this huge need of uh, academic uh, communication, and that's how the the English language improvement program was created, and it became eventually the the um, uh, like helping international and domestic students with their with their oral communication and the written communication. So it was, a, it, 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 it still is, but unfortunately this is closing this the because of economical problems, the pro program is closing. But I think that was a great help for um, for me as an international person to, to have this support, this academic support um, to be able to, to write a, academic papers. So now there are, um, unfortunately, like I said, the, it's closing. So it's uh, um, be because of the the economic problems that we're having. So that's one of the, the issues that we're facing. But uh, I also, now that I'm, I'm on the other side as a, as a faculty member, I always recommend my students to go to the CLDC to get some support with their, with their um, resume and the nice thing is that it's a nice combination of international and domestic students and they can also help each other so it's it's a great uh, it's it's a great support to that that it's something that the university is offering okay um would anybody else like to comment on those resources um yeah i will um greg um okay. so as a student, I did definitely use both the CD, CLDC and the um, Writing Center. Um, the CLDC more so especially because um, searching for jobs in America has a very different cultural context than searching for jobs internationally. So for example, internationally, if I'm doing a resume, some places will like my photograph, my age and stuff. And in America, it's a no, no because of discrimination laws. So kind of have having the CLDC work with you and that is very helpful. Um, there was a comment about the fact that international students don't normally use the CLDC. That's because a lot of times, um, you know, the international experience is structured in a very academic and then you have some of the non-academic supports like the CLDC 
um, that normally people don't know. So, you know, this would be a call to faculty and the colleges to incorporate that more into their program and especially targeted at not just their graduating students, but their incoming international so that you can get them in the pipeline to start doing some of these things. Um, the other component I'd like to add on to that is that um, there is a lot of unseen work that is done by both faculty and the community to make sure that Athens is welcoming for a lot of folks. So I'm, I'm glad Ash was talking about the football or soccer community in Athens. And I remember way back in the day when there was no community and some of us had to build it from scratch um, with the Athens, um, with from the Athens Community League and then from the International, um, International Student World Cup that now has more substantial support from ISFS. But um, this is one of the things I also encourage the colleges to do is to look at how this work is being done by just not their faculty, but some of the community organizations across um, across Athens. Um, and it's not just the soccer community. So, you know, the Islamic Center plays a really critical role in making sure our, um, our students coming from Islamic countries are welcome. Then they have programming that they can go to on a regular basis. I know we have a ton of religious groups um, like the SDA Church um, and the Catholic Church and some of the Pentecostals that also provide a ton of support. And, and these, this work is not always seen. Sometimes in certain academic spaces, this work is not necessarily um, privileged or highlighted and people don't necessarily see how it's important. But at the end of the day, a lot of our life is lived outside of the academic realm and in the real world. And these are the things that help us stick. Like, like I said, I have stayed in Athens for the most part because I we we have helped build a vibrant soccer community. And so if we don't have the COVID, I'm playing soccer on Saturdays. I'm pulling a lot of international students to go play soccer with me. And I'm paying, and right now, because I work in, in Athens, I'm paying for that team. And I know professors like um, Garcel Sua in the College of Engineering w pays a lot of money so that we can have international students come and be part of the community because these things are not cheap. And so how can the city of Athens support some of these programs and how can the colleges partner with the city to make sure that some of these um, co-curricular, extracurricular activities are supported and sustainable so that um, not just um, the community can benefit, but students who don't necessarily always have the economic ability to pay for some of these services can benefit. It's, it's always a really, it's always a good conversation to have because futsal, for example, costs a ton of money and we had to put a lot of effort to get that done. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Papa. That's, that's very interesting. Um, we have a another uh, question from the audience, and um, it's kind of based on based on a reality I think that is um, always true, but it's uh, magnified by the uh, pandemic. So um, people would like to know how can we encourage international students to take advantage of counseling and psychological services, and and I think this is this is a problem all the time, but um but definitely during this time when it's not safe to be in close quarters with other people. Um, so uh, I think we can look at that from both of those perspectives. And I'm going to ask Gabby to share something first. Yes, when I was uh, a student, I uh, in 2007, um, it was kind of like I by 2008, actually, my mom got very sick and she had cancer and I had to go and uh, like and take care of her. So during that time, um, unfortunately, she passed in 2008 and I um, I came back and I was devastated. I was not myself um, like I was just not, not a very not, not very into the really school. So I was doing my work, but I was not happy. I was just having a really bad time because I was not coping with um, with with her loss. Like so it was just so, so bad. So. Um, I like a friend of mine actually recommended to go to to, to the um, uh, psychological services to, to get some help. And at the beginning, I was kind of hesitant because I was nervous that the way um, we face death in Mexico is way too different than the, the way it's faced in, in America. But uh, having the opportunity to talk to someone 
who was uh, an expert and just to let it out helped me so much. Also, the, uh, at the time they had uh, at the entrance of the of the uh, of the, the doctor's office, they had like these different um, pamphlets with help of uh, like very they were very little where they have like self self confidence so like uh, find uh, finding uh, like focus so they were offering so many different things like jealousy and all these different things that you don't even think about but they were extremely helpful so while I was waiting to get into the office I was able to read them and it helped me to to get that strength that I needed. So it was uh, like it came from different channels, but I think it's important that we as faculty or we as students recommend that because um, sometimes we don't really have someone to, to tell you firsthand that they have experienced a good support. And I think that, uh, that I, I would totally recommend it because it was extremely helpful for me. Uh, Great, thank you. I'd like to ask Ash to share his experience as well. Cheers, Greg. Thank you. Uh, and I didn't use the the kind of to go off the question of psychological support services, but just to reiterate um, what Gabby was talking about. Unfortunately, I lost my mum and she passed away in, in August 2019 um, and it's still very raw for me. But I just want to kind of say like as, a, as an international um, being in a different country when when something like that is occurring, it throws a lot of turmoil into your life and I think the, the thing that I want to highlight here is the support that we can offer and, and the services that are out there. But we also need to be mindful that international students, international faculty might be going through something that is is very raw and very personal, but also can be very costly. I had to go back to England twice um, in, in that process while she was kind of going through and, and she was in hospice with cancer and then I had to go back afterwards um, for, for the funeral and, and all that that's a cost burden, time burden and I've just got to say that the, the, the Patton College and the Department of Recreation and Sport Pedagogy was absolutely magnificent for supporting me through that process and the same with any international student and any student that goes for that for that matter but any any student and especially international students and faculty that have to go through that knowing that they've got to fly back somewhere, knowing that there's a lot of things that they need to do. But then even after it, when when everybody's going on with their everyday life, I'm still having to pick up pieces with my dad back home and, and making sure that I call in and check in every day and, and thinking, especially now with the pandemic, not being able to go back and support him, that that's tough. And, and I think sometimes we we crack on as, as faculty and students, just just hoping that we get through these processes. But we need people that are understanding. We need people that can can share their experiences. And, and one thing I would say to iterate Gabby's point is that we need to be that part of that support or at least be aware of where to point the student in the right direction or where to point the faculty member in that direction, especially as an immigrant, because the, the process means going back, means visa issues, means more anxiety and especially if there's visas running out and there's more anxiety with that and getting back into the country. I went home one time and forgot a little bit of paperwork. Luckily, it was OK. But the anxiety behind that on top of the trauma that I was going through, that made me feel really, really vulnerable in an airport, for instance. And and that them, them experiences, then it, sometimes you need somebody to, to kind of talk about them experiences, you know, and I think Gabby makes a great point. And I'm glad that the university, we do have services but it's maybe highlighting those services more to the, to the students and faculty that may need them. Thanks, Ash. <clears throat> yeah, bo both of you are reminding me, I, I also lost my mother in July of 2019, Ash, so pretty close to when, when you did. And, and it's, yeah, it's still difficult, right? So the next question um, that I have, and, and some of you have touched on this, I think the the last things that Papa shared were were similar to this. Um, I want to know what suggestions you have for improving the support that is available in the community, and that so that could be from the university, from the the city of Athens, from um, other uh, organizations in Southeast Ohio. Um, so the larger community, and I'm going to ask Gabriella to um, share her thoughts first. I think in order to ask uh, for support from the community, we have to go out there, right? So uh, we have to get involved in the community if we need help. We have to offer our help first. So I don't know, like for me, 
since I have two kids in school, I go volunteer at the school. It's not always easy because I do have an accent. The kids ask me if I speak Spanish, even though I talk to them in English. And the parents sometimes avoid. So uh, it may take us a little extra of uh, effort to do, but I think we have to we have to get in into the community. I don't know what the community can do, but um, in order for them to know about us, we we have to be in the community. It's not always easy because, you know, as parents, for example, we are always busy. Everybody is busy, so we don't have time for the next person too much. But I think if we pay attention, you know, to the left and to the right, um, then we, you can ask for help. So I think all we can do is to educate the community that there are people who did not grow up here to going to school. So the school system, even though I teach at the university, the K-12 system and I have two kids in school, I still I don't think I understand everything how it works. <laughs> all the extra curricular and everything the teachers do for the kids since it's a totally different system. Um, but for me, this is what I'm trying. I go out there, I tell them I did not grow up here. Please help me, you know, <laughs> please. I don't know, like, should I do this? Should I do that? Even though I ask people much younger than me. Um, so I, I don't know, like it's at the human level. And uh, if we are out there and people understand that we don't know everything <laughs> because like, especially with adults, you are at a certain level. Oh, you work at the university. You are like, may people look at us. Oh, you know everything. I mean, you are in education. They don't know. We don't know, <laughs> right? <laughs> All of that. Um, how every school is a little different. I move my kids from one school to another, moving with jobs. And I learned that it's different even in America from one school to another. So I think it's these things are also uh, useful for everybody. So I think the more we educate other around us, uh, they can help because they may need help. So we have to be able to help. <laughs> yeah, thank thank you very much. I, I can tell you I, I didn't grow up in Ohio either. So the education system is just as confusing. My son will be graduating from high school this semester and I'm still trying to figure it out. So <laughs> um, it's, it's yeah, I don't know. Maybe we can share our notes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, next, I'd like to hear from um, from Papa about your suggestions for ways that the community could provide more support. Yeah, well, I think I, I have said a lot, but um, I would like to say um, really great thank you to the Athens community, especially during these COVID times for helping with the International Student Emergency Fund. Um, that was led by Patton College. Um, a lot of students from the Patton College who were definitely follow the, the the call to lead a mantra of the college because they have definitely led in um, community um, liaison with the investee in the community. I know through the Sugar Bush Foundation and other community members, there's been a lot of support. And so, um, and um, I'd like to thank Faustino Mensah and um, some of the other folks in there who did a really great job of helping bridge that gap for all international students. That is really helpful. Um, beyond that and beyond that one time thing, I think um, from a college perspective, um, we have the academic stuff down really well. Um, there is always room for improvement, but I think we do a very good job at that. Um, one of the things I will point back to is beyond the college, beyond the academic component, you know, how are our international students sticking around? What are the co-curriculars, be they religious, um, sports, and whatever, how are they how are they engaging with the community? Um, I know the colleges cannot take that work on themselves, but they can ask through the I, um, International Students um, Faculty Services Office. And then I know um, so we have a lot of great international and community experts at the Center for International Studies. So for example, I can think of somebody like um, Bose Maposa, who is really involved within the community and at the graduate level. And then when you go, in, um, she used to be at this experiential learning office, but now she's in the COVID support office, like Dr. Maria Modail. These are all folks who do a lot of work within the um, community. And these are great expertise that is within the academic environment. So how do we leverage those to make those support more systematic, not just for select group of students, but for all students so that we can make those spaces more welcome. And you know, 
Um, I think the college, the Patton College is doing a great job by asking us to share some of our experiences here because this has been very helpful for, for me to share some of these things and I hope others have I've learned a lot and I hope others have learned too. So, you know, leveraging the expertise we have now because we do have that expertise, finding ways to make some of those ad hoc um, support structures more systematic and more welcoming. Um, I would say a lot of my friends and former classmates have gone on to other colleges and the one thing they always say is there's no place like Athens in terms of the support and then some of us who have been here have always been like but it could always get better so you know there's always that tension and of you know Athens is great but it could always get better so how do we get better um so um that that is all I was saying for now thanks Papa thanks, I, I agree there's you know there's always room for improvement right so that's that's the, those are really good suggestions. Um, I'm going to ask Ash to share his thoughts on that too. Cheers, Greg, and, and great stuff, Papa. I think I'm going to come from two perspectives. First of all, I'm going to kind of focus on the student perspective, uh, and and Papa and, and Gabby and Gabriella, who've all been students in in America, can definitely give better insight than me. But one thing that we in the Patent College and the International Advisory Committee is, are trying to do is is definitely promote awareness of international student um, issues uh, and I think we've been on we were very fortunate to be able to get a slot in the the, the Patton College colloquium that happened um, at the beginning of the semester where we could highlight some some of the issues listen to some personal stories and um, I think that was a fantastic way to get the ball rolling we also did that in the fall through the uh, leadership and advocate uh, summit advocacy summit sorry um, so I think from that perspective, we're starting to, to get the ball moving, but the same issue is arising that pandemic or no pandemic, international students have found it very difficult during summer months when they're not getting stipends and, and especially at graduate student when they're not having that financial support. What do they do and how do they how do they get through them summer months? And I think it was it more bring, brought more to our attention during the pandemic last summer, but this summer is going to be in exactly the same boat. And I think because of their situation where, again, going back to what I said about visa, same for students, they can't go out in the local community like domestic students and work in, in a bar or in, a, in a, a, a coffee shop. They have to be tied to the university. So we need to make more maybe um, processes of how we can get those international students a, a bit of job um, and get some income um, during these summer months if they're staying in Athens, because not all have, can afford to or will be going home in the summer. So that was from the student perspective that we're trying so hard to do. On the flip side, from a faculty perspective, a couple of things that um, I, I believe needs kind of addressing for faculty and international faculty especially, is something like as easy as you have to file taxes here. Like where I come from, you don't have to file taxes. So then having to go through that process was so foreign to me and, and so um, kind of anxiety ridden because I didn't want to mess up. I didn't know if I was going to owe money, whether I was going to get any money back. So maybe kind of we, we talk about orientations all the time and I know a lot of orientation you get gone bombarded with information but is there a way the HR can get involved and and legal affairs and maybe other colleges at the university where we can give some sort of kind of munch and lens on these processes for instance and I think that's an important part and then also with that transition I think mentorship's a key thing so is there departments with international faculty where they're bringing new international faculty in or the college, for instance, and there can be a mentorship and mentorship where then they've got that process of bouncing off one another to help that transition be even smoother. Like I say, I was one of the fortunate ones because of the amazing people here. I, it helps us speak the language, I guess. It helps maybe that I've come from England. The culture is a little bit similar. But I think the big thing from my pers perspective is that we need more awareness of what we go through as internationals and we need more assistance and hopefully the domestic uh, faculty and students can assist in that process as well as the services at the university. Great, thanks Ash. Great suggestions everyone. Um, I'm going to ask Gabby for um, some thoughts on this issue as well. What do you think that the community could do in addition to what's happening already to um, provide better support? Yeah, I think Ash did uh, say that the right things. I, I do think that we do get bombarded with all these emails of join this place, join that place. So it's uh, it's a little bit uh, hard to like, where, where do I fit in, right? 
So maybe at also at the personal level, say, you know what, I did this program and it worked for me. So it's it's a matter of um, international students also helping each other and saying what worked for them and also but having the the the, the right information because sometimes the, the problem is not having the, the right information. So for example, and um, something that we always focus on the university, but don't see the things that are out there. Like, for example, like Live Healthy Appalachia, which helps with it has a cheap program and is great to to learn like eating habits. And that's pretty, pretty healthy, pretty nice. And you get to know other people outside of the university. So that's great. Great, thank you. Thank you. So so Gabby, I, I'd like to continue with you since you're you're with us right now. Um, and what what do you think we could do in order to prepare or train faculty to work better with international students? We have a number of audience questions that kind of all revolve around this this big theme. Um, so one of them dealt with um, faculty doing th using things like idiomatic expressions and colloquial um, expressions. And I, I know um, since I worked with you in the linguistics department, we're both familiar with that issue and and addressing that. But there are a number of other things as well, including um, maintaining humility and um and not uh, and and trying to resist the implicit bias that we have um, in some situations. So, what what suggestions do you have for preparing faculty? Yeah, I think you 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 have a very good point. Like, don't assume that because I'm Mexican, I know how to cook Mexican food, right? Like, I'm a horrible cook. <laughs> so, uh, but at the same time, like maybe the experience that I've had within like my home country might be a very different. Um, like maybe the the things that I have read or the things that uh, that I have seen, they are very different. There are many difference generational and also from state to state so you cannot really assume that this person has this um like uh, different patches of knowledge just because they are from that country so yeah don't is i i think it's important not to take a, a person for granted assuming that that's how they should be because they are from that country yeah thank you um I think this is a topic that we could probably discuss uh, for months and hopefully we're just getting this started and we will engage in these discussions with our communities across campus and across campuses. Um, so um, thank you everyone. I, I really want to thank all of our panelists for today's event and for sharing their time and their experiences. Um, I also want to thank all of you for joining us today. The evaluation for today's event is being placed in the chat and we encourage you to take a few minutes to give us feedback about your experience. A recording of the session will be added to the Patent College YouTube channel by the end of this week. And if you want to rewatch it or share the session with your colleagues and coworkers or others, I'd also like you to, to encourage you to join us for our national speaker on anti-racism, Dr. S. Kent Butler, on um, this coming Friday, February 12th from noon until 1 p.m. The next educational session in the Patent College of Education Global Issues on Immigration series will be held on Monday, March 8th from noon to 1.30 p.m. And this topic will be honoring the experiences of immigrant populations in research and scholarship. That session will be moderated by my colleague, Dr. Dwan Robinson. Thank you all for joining us and be well and be safe.